aspirations to the presidency, which from this time never left him until he had one foot in the grave. As a successful, popular, and ambitious man who had already rendered important services, we cannot wonder that he sought the envied prize. Who in the nation was more eminent than he? But such a consummation of ambition is not attained by merit alone. He had enemies, and he had powerful rivals. In 1824, John Quincy Adams, as Moreau's Secretary of State, was in the line of promotion, a statesman of experience and abilities, the superior of Clay in learning, who had spent his life in the public service, and in honorable positions, especially as a foreign minister. He belonged to the reigning party, and was the choice of New England. Moreover, he had the prestige of a great name. He was, it is true, far from popular, was cold and severe in manners, and irritable in temperament. But he was public-spirited, patriotic, incorruptible, lofty in sentiment, and unstained by vices. Andrew Jackson was also a formidable competitor, a military hero, the idol of the West, and a man of extraordinary force of character, with undoubted executive abilities, but without much experience in civil affairs, self-willed, despotic in temper, and unscrupulous. Crawford, of Georgia, Secretary of the Treasury, with great Southern prestige, and an adroit politician, was also a candidate. Superior to all these candidates, in political genius, was Calhoun of South Carolina, yet not so prominent as he afterwards became. The popular choice in 1824 lay between Jackson and Adams, and as no candidate obtained a majority of the electoral votes, the election reverted to the House of Representatives, and Adams was chosen, much to the chagrin of Jackson, who had the largest number of popular votes, and the disappointment of Clay, who did not attempt to conceal it. When the latter saw that his own chances were small, however, he had thrown his influence in favor of Adams, securing his election, and became his Secretary of State. Jackson was indignant, as he felt he had been robbed of the prize by a secret bargain, or coalition, between Clay and Adams. In retiring from the Speakership of the House, which he had held so long, Clay received the formal and hearty thanks of that body for his undeniably distinguished services as presiding officer. In knowledge of parliamentary law and tactics, in prompt decisions, never once overruled in all his long career, in fairness, courtesy, self-command, and control of the House at the stormiest times, he certainly never had a superior. Friends and enemies alike recognized and cordially expressed their sense of his masterly abilities. The administration of Adams was not eventful, but to his credit he made only four removals from office during his term of service, and these for good cause. He followed out the policy of his predecessors, even under pressure from his cabinet, refusing to recognize either friends or enemies as such, but simply holding public officers to their duty. So, too, in his foreign policy, which was conservative and prudent, and free from entangling alliances, at a time when the struggle for independence among the South American republics presented an occasion for interference, and when the debates on the Panama mission, a proposed council of South and Central American republics at Panama, to which the United States were invited to send representatives, were embarrassing to the executive. The services of Mr. Clay as Secretary of State were not distinguished. He made a number of satisfactory treaties with foreign powers and exhibited great catholicity of mind, but he was embroiled in quarrels and disputes anything but glorious, and he further found his situation irksome. His field was the legislature. As an executive officer, he was out of place. It may be doubted whether he would have made as good a president as many inferior politicians. He detested office labor, and was sensitive to hostile criticism. His acceptance of the office of Secretary of State was probably a blunder as his appointment was, though unjustly, thought by many to be in fulfillment of a bargain, and it did not advance his popularity. He was subject to slanders and misrepresentations. The secretaryship, instead of being a step to the presidency, was thus rather an impediment in his way. It was not even a position of as much power as the speakership. It gave him no excitement, and did not keep him before the eyes of the people. His health failed, he even thought of resignation. The supporters of the Adams administration, those who more and more came to rank themselves as promoters of tariffs and internal improvements, with liberal views as to the constitutional powers of the national government, gradually consolidated in opposition to the party headed by Jackson. The former called themselves National Republicans, and the latter Democratic Republicans. During the Jacksonian administrations, they became known more simply as Whigs and Democrats. 
on the accession of general jackson to the presidency in eighteen twenty nine mr clay retired to his farm at ashland but while he amused himself by raising fine cattle and horses and straightening out his embarrassed finances he was still the recognized leader of the national republican party he was then fifty-two years of age at his very best and strongest period he took more interest in politics than in agriculture or in literary matters he was not a learned man nor a great reader but a close observer of men and of all political movements he was a great favorite and received perpetual ovations whenever he traveled always ready to make speeches at public meetings which were undoubtedly eloquent and instructive but not masterpieces like those of webster at plymouth and bunker hill they were not rich in fundamental principles of government and political science and far from being elaborate but were earnest patriotic and impassioned clay was fearless ingenuous and chivalric and won the hearts of the people which webster failed to do both were great debaters the one appealing to the understanding and the other to popular sentiments webster was cold massive logical although occasionally illuminating his argument with a grand glow of eloquence the admiration of lawyers and clergymen clay was the delight of the common people impulsive electrical brilliant calling out the sympathies of his hearers and captivating them by his obvious sincerity and frankness not so much convincing them as moving them and stimulating them to action webster rarely lost his temper but he could be terribly sarcastic harsh and even fierce clay was passionate and irritable but forgiving and generous loath to lose a friend and eager for popularity webster seemed indifferent to applause and even to ordinary friendship proud and self-sustained clay was vain and susceptible to flattery no stranger could approach webster but clay was as accessible as a primitive bishop new england was proud of webster but the west loved clay kentucky would follow her favorite to the last whatever mistakes he might make but massachusetts deserted webster when he failed to respond to her popular convictions both men were disappointed in the prize they sought one because he was not loved by the people colossal as they admitted him to be a frowning jupiter tonins absorbed in his own majesty the other because he had incurred the hatred of jackson and other party chiefs who were envious of his popularity and fearful of his ascendancy the hatred which clay and jackson had for each other was inexorable it steeped them both in bitterness and uncompromising opposition they were rivals the heads of their respective parties clay regarded jackson as an ignorant despotic unscrupulous military chieftain who had been raised to power by the blind adoration of military success while jackson looked upon clay as an intriguing politician without honesty industry or consistency gifted only in speech-making their quarrels and mutual abuse formed no small part of the political history of the country during jackson's administration and have received from historians more attention than they deserved mr colton takes up about one half of his first volume of the life of clay in dismal documents which few care about relating to what he calls the great conspiracy that is the intrigues of politicians to rob clay of his rights the miserable party warfare which raged so furiously and blindly from eighteen twenty five to eighteen thirty six i need not here dwell on the contentions and slanders and hatreds which were so prominent at the time the two great national parties were formed and which divided the country until the civil war the most notable portion of henry clay's life was his great career as senator in congress which he entered in december eighteen thirty one two years after the inauguration of president jackson the first subject of national importance to which he gave his attention was the one with which his name and fame are mostly identified the tariff to a moderate form of which the president in eighteen twenty nine had announced himself to be favorable but which he afterwards more and more opposed on the ground that the revenues already produced were in excess of the needs of the government the subject was ably discussed first in a resolution introduced by senator clay declarative of principles involving some reduction of duties on articles that did not compete with american industries but maintaining generally the american system successfully introduced by him in the tariff of eighteen twenty four and then in a bill framed in accordance with the resolution both of which were passed in eighteen thirty two clay's speeches on this tariff of eighteen thirty two were among the strongest and ablest he ever delivered indeed he apparently exhausted his subject little has been added by political economists to the arguments for protection since his day his main points were that it was beneficial to all parts of the union and absolutely necessary to much the largest portion that the price of cotton and of other agricultural products had been sustained and a decline averted by the protective system 
that even if the foreign demand for cotton had been diminished by the operation of this system the plea of the southern leaders the diminution had been more than compensated in the additional demand created at home that the competition produced by the system reduces the price of manufactured articles for which he adduced his facts and finally that the policy of free trade without benefiting any section of the union would by subjecting us to foreign legislation regulated by foreign interests lead to the prostration and ruin of our manufactories it must be remembered that this speech was made in 1832 before our manufacturers really infant industries could compete successfully with foreigners in anything at the present time there are many interests which need no protection at all and the protection of these interests as a matter of course fosters monopolies and hence the progress which is continually being made in manufactures enabling this country to be independent of foreign industries makes protective duties on many articles undesirable now which were expedient and even necessary sixty years ago an illustration of the fallacy of tariffs founded on immutable principles when they are simply matters of expediency according to the changing interests of nations we have already in the lecture on jackson described the nullification episode with the threatening protests against the tariff of 1828 and its amendments of 1832 jackson's prompt action and clay's patriotic and earnest efforts resulting in the compromise tariff of march 1833 by this bill duties were to be gradually reduced from 25 per cent ad valorem to 20 per cent mr webster was not altogether satisfied nor were the extreme tariff men who would have run the risks of the threatened nullification by south carolina it proved however a popular measure and did much to tranquilize the nation yet it did not wholly satisfy the south nor any extreme partisans as compromises seldom do and clay lost many friends in consequence a result which he anticipated and manfully met it led to one of his finest bursts of eloquence i have said he been accused of ambition in presenting this measure ambition inordinate ambition lo groveling souls who are utterly incapable of elevating themselves to the higher and nobler duties of pure patriotism beings who forever keeping their own selfish aims in view decide all public measures by their presumed influence on their own aggrandizement judge me by the venal rule which they prescribe for themselves i am no candidate for any office in the gift of these states united or separated i never wish never expect to be pass this bill tranquilize the country restore confidence and affection for the union and i am willing to go to ashland and renounce public service forever yes i have ambition but it is the ambition of being the humble instrument in the hands of providence to reconcile a divided people once more to revive concord and harmony in a distracted land the pleasing ambition of contemplating the glorious spectacle of a free united prosperous and fraternal people the policy which mr clay advocated with so much ability during the whole of his congressional life was that manufactures as well as the culture of rice tobacco and cotton would enrich this country and therefore ought to be fostered and protected by congress whatever mr hayne or mr calhoun should say to the contrary or even general jackson himself whose sympathies were with the south and consequently with slavery therefore clay is called the father of the american system he was the advocate not of any local interests but the interests of the country as a whole thus establishing his claim to be a statesman rather than a politician who never looked beyond local and transient interests and is especially subservient to party dictation the southern politicians may not have wished to root out manufacturing altogether but it was their policy to keep the agricultural interests in the ascendant soon after the close of the session of the twenty-second congress mr clay on his return to ashland put into execution a project he had long contemplated of visiting the eastern cities at that period even an excursion of one thousand miles was a serious affair and attended with great discomfort wherever mr clay went he was received with enthusiasm receptions public dinners and fetes succeeded each other at all the principal cities in baltimore in wilmington and in philadelphia he was entertained at balls and banquets in new york he was the guest of the city and was visited by thousands eager to shake his hand the company controlling the line between new york and boston tendered to him the use of one of their fine steamers to rhode island where every social honor was publicly given him 
in boston he was welcomed by a committee of forty in behalf of the young men headed by mr winthrop and was received by a committee of old men when he was eloquently addressed by mr william sullivan and was subsequently waited upon by the mayor and aldermen of the city deputations from portland and portsmouth besought the honor of a visit at charlestown on bunker hill edward everett welcomed him in behalf of the city and pronounced one of his felicitous speeches at faneuil hall a delegation of young men presented him with a pair of silver pitchers he was even dragged to lyceum lectures during the two weeks he remained in boston he thence proceeded amid public demonstrations to worcester springfield hartford northampton pittsfield troy albany and back again to new york the carriage makers of newark begged his acceptance of one of their most costly carriages for the use of his wife no one except washington lafayette and general grant ever received more enthusiastic ovations in new england all in recognition of his services as a statesman without his having reached any higher position than that of senator or secretary of state in such a rapid review of the career of mr clay as we are obliged to make it is impossible to enter upon the details of political movements and the shifting grounds of party organizations and warfare we must not however lose sight of that most characteristic element of clay's public life his perennial candidature for the presidency we have already seen him in eighteen twenty four when his failure was evident throwing his influence into the scale for john quincy adams in eighteen twenty eight as adams the secretary of state he could not be a rival to his chief and so escaped the whelming overthrow with which jackson defeated their party in 1832 he was an intensely popular candidate of the national republicans especially the merchants and manufacturers of the north and east and the friends of the united states bank but southern hostility to his tariff principles and the rally of the people in support of jackson's war on moneyed institutions threw him out again in notable defeat in 1836 and again in 1840 clay was prominent before the conventions of the whig or national republican party but other interests subordinated his claims to nomination and the election of van buren by the democrats in 1836 and of harrison by the whigs in 1840 kept him still in abeyance in 1844 clay was again the whig candidate the chief issue being the admission of texas but he was defeated by polk and the democrats and after that the paramount slavery question pushed him aside and he dropped out of the race the bitter war which clay made on the administration of general jackson especially in reference to the united states bank question has already been noticed and although it is an important passage in his history i must pass it by to avoid repetition which is always tedious all i would say in this connection is that clay was foremost among the supporters of the bank and opposed not only the removal of deposits but also the sub-treasury scheme of mr van buren that followed the failure to maintain the bank some of his ablest oratory was expended in the unsuccessful opposition to these democratic measures End of section 7.